marginally. As much satisfaction as Clarksville would have felt joining in the fight against Kong as the Big Ape rampaged through the Lunar City's entertainment district, he was sidelined, marginalized, if you will, by the needs of the people for fleeing the Noodle District, located on the periphery of the action. Don't you think I'd be more useful on the trolley full of explosives headed for Kong's left ankle? Seville had questioned. No, Clark, old Dr. Thanatoxin shook his head. The whole place is on fire. The city's noodle district is endangered. Only you have the leadership skills to take charge of the situation. Reluctantly, Seville agreed. He accepted the offer of an extra clip of ammunition and a ride out to the, to the noodle district. You can see the fires from here, the driver, and orderly with the science division's paramilitary forces, shouted above the roar of some obscure stoner rock band blaring from the jeep speakers. When I was growing up, these things didn't come with sophisticated stereo sound systems, Seville nodded at the dashboard to say nothing of air conditioning. He must be nervous, thought the driver. He would never ramble on like this otherwise. It wasn't that the driver, the son of German immigrants, had intimate knowledge of Seville's habits, but rather that he had been listening closely to the gossip going around the laboratory complex about the big agent recently attached to its staff. How, how old are you? the driver asked. His own nerves were evident. Seville checked the double-headed eagle carved into the handle of his weapon. Never you mind, he advised the driver. Let me out here, he ordered, throwing the door open. You want me to wait? The driver shouted to the big man already running towards the flames. No, came the answer through the smoke and dense noodle smell. Seville ran directly into the first significant noodle operation he saw. Inside he found an old man and his three daughters struggling with an immense vat of some kind of sauce, probably Mongolian, although it was hard to be sure amid the volcanic amalgam of odors inundating the scene. What are you people doing here, he demanded. Get out! Get out before Kong's droppings arrive! We can't leave the sauce, the old man cried. You old fool! Seville yelled. He ran forward and seized the man by the shoulder as if to forcibly drag him from the burning shop. Please, one of the daughters begged. If we lose the sauce, we may as well perish in the flames. The same look of desperation was in each face as Seville glanced from one to the next. Fools, he barked, but muscled them aside, grasping the vat in his arms. Its weight was too great, however, even for his titanic frame. Instead, he put his back to it, and, with the help of the noodle maker and his family, hefted it aloft, using his legs as twin elevators. On his back, he carried it out into the street, just in time to witness the shop's roof collapse. Guided by the hands of the old man and his daughters, the vat sank to the ground. Seville sat down beside it, momentarily beaten. The noodles we can make again, using only the, only the simplest of ingredients, the old man panted, but the sauce is irreplaceable. Thank you, thank you, thank you, the woman told Seville, who, despite his aching legs and back, began hauling himself to his feet. Drink this, one of the women, women instructed Seville, handing him a bottle of murky, sediment-laden fluid. It will restore your strength. Seville looked dubiously at the concoction. Yet as he looked about at the dozens of burning shops and hundreds of crazed noodle makers running about, he cast aside his, his reservations and downed a good third of it. Indeed, it was potent stuff, tasting strongly of clams and moss. It sent numbing heat through his, own, his limbs. He handed the bottle back to the woman and raced away to help others as she and her sisters pulled a rude tarpaulin over the vat. vat. Seville worked steadily through the night, leading many to safety and helping to secure valuable noodle-making equipment. He was later too exhausted to feel much, dis much disappointment on learning that Kong had been put down without his involvement. Dicot. Are you aware that the cannabis plant is a dicot? Homegrown Malone asked Seville, asked Clark Seville as the two sat in the hallway of the Raymond Boyer Memorial Hospital. Seville, who had been staring at the lion of ambulatory wounded down the hall, responded without turning around. No, he said. Then, as his sleep-deprived thoughts can't caught up with themselves, he turned to glance at the monster sitting beside him. Yes, actually, he modified his answer. I did know that. Malone nodded thoughtfully. You don't smoke marijuana, do you? he asked. No. Seville stared at the tips of his shoes, just visible past his black-clad knees. Malone nodded again, this time briefly, in acceptance and repose. He peered down the hallway to the right. Opposite Seville in the, line of, in the line of wounded, he spied a young nurse. Excuse me for a second, he said to Seville and got up. Excuse me, he said again, this time to the nurse, but do you have any information on the Michelson boy? The nurse, a pretty if somewhat overweight young woman, looked up at Malone from her metal clipboard in shock. What was this creature? Don't be alarmed, Malone urged. I'm not particularly dangerous. Instead of offering a reassuring smile, which he knew would be misinterpreted as a prelude to predatory feasting, he merely twinkled at the nurse, something he did with his eyes. 
The nurse, glancing at Malone's expensive motorcycle boots, finding the reassurance she required, she required there, returned her gaze to one of Malone's far-spread eyes and asked, What was the name? Michelson. Tommy, Tommy Michelson. He's about 15, I'd say. The young woman leafed through, other, through some pages. No, she shook her head. I don't see the name here. And you, are you family? No, just a friend. Try the police, she, su she suggested. They've set up a temporary processing desk down on the second floor of the West Tower. Okay, thank you. Malone nodded and walked back to Seville. I'm going to check on somebody, he told the agent. Will you, will you be okay? Seville looked at the monster fellow out of the corner of his eye. He sighed. Marijuana slows reaction time, he said. Dulls the instinct. The killer instinct, Malone clarified. Seville turned his head slightly more in Malone's direction. Yeah, he agreed, turning back to the contemplation of his steel-toed shoes. Homegrown Malone smiled a half-smile. He had plenty he could say, plenty he could tell Seville, both about the world and about Seville himself, but he said nothing. He said nothing of what he saw in Seville's face, in his hands, and in the slump of his shoulders. Instead, he made a vague gesture with his paddle-like hand and said only, All right, I'll see you. He headed for the West Tower. Down the hall, from just around the corner, the young nurse he had spoken to watched him go. We sure get the freaks in here, she whispered to one of her co-workers. That's the moon for you, the other woman replied. Well, if this, this is the way it is all the time, I'm going back to Earth. The other nurse snorted. Crime, ignorance, intolerance. She stabbed with words. You can keep the Earth. You don't know how good you've got it here. Give it a few more weeks. With the army bringing giant apes up here? The first nurse, nurse snapped. Yeah, well, they only did that to try to scare us into accepting a traditionalist structure up here. Once the talking apes realize how their brother has been so cruelly misused. Ah, uh, you're talking out of your ass, Sally, the first nurse interrupted. Sally stared into her fellow nurse's eyes as if studying the contents of a disappointing buffet. She nodded curtly and walked out into the hall with a dismissive wave of her hand. Tonight, a hologram of John Coltrane would entertain the battered city. Gloofer. Alex Spaghetti wanted to make the obvious joke when he first heard the, word, the term gloofer, but somehow couldn't work a craft reference into the conversation. Instead, he wondered aloud what science fiction franchise the term came from. The gloofer isn't from any series of films or books, Rusty McCabbage answered. His tone was serious. The joke wouldn't have went down well anyway. It's a real entity living somewhere out there in the lands beyond the forest. McCabbage pointed ominously behind Spaghetti. The latter rolled his eyes in that direction, but was afraid to turn and look. So, Spaghetti began, where do I come in? McCabbage glanced to the left and right like a man selling a baby in an alley. We want you to go out there and find the gloofer, he told Spaghetti. Find it and bring it back here. Think of it as a test, the, the Laris added. She stood just behind McCabbage, dressed in a purple jumpsuit with sharp chevrons of green down the front. A test? Spaghetti repeated incredulously. Didn't I get the plunger successfully? Didn't I unclog the toilet without incident? How much more do I have to do to prove myself to you people? You still haven't brought your club and its members to the community, the Laris reminded him. McCabbage, however, held up his hand and glanced at the Laris. As I have already said, that can wait, he spoke over his shoulder. Turning back to Spaghetti, he continued. Your work with the plunger was most impressive. However, this assignment will be unaccompanied. That should show you just how much trust we have. We now have in you, Alec. Spaghetti would have liked to grumble and prevaricate a little more, but he was enjoying the comforts of his new home, new house, too much to begrudge the community this task. Okay, he sighed. What do, what do I have to do? Get into your squirrel costume, the Laris instructed. The next day, Spaghetti was sweating profusely as he hiked through the dense forest dressed as a giant squirrel, looking for the mysterious gloofer. He had been told that... that, that he had been told that the being might have information about the disappearance of the macaque people. Squirrel people, spaghetti grouse, macaque people, how about horse people, yak people? He marched through the tangled undergrowth wondering if he was involved in some elaborate space-age version of candid camera. At least the costume protected him from the scrapes and scratches he would be covered with otherwise. But that hardly makes up for the lack of visibility, he complained. He continually had to adjust his mask in order to see where he was going. Still, he stumbled on, only knowing that he must get to the other side of the forest, the place where the grasslands began. I can't take this anymore, Spaghetti screamed. He was urinating against the tree, having fumbled for some time to get his penis clear of the costume. He pulled the squirrel mask back from his face and nearly started crying with the relief of it. He was amazed to see that the sun was still high in the sky. He had been trudging through the trees for hours and expected darkness to be imminent. Suddenly he realized that a voice had spoken to him. Dragging his mask back into place, he glanced around. 
A dog stood some dozen feet away from him. What's wrong? The d dog repeated in a low, throaty monotone. Alex Spaghetti did not take his eyes off the dog as he wrestled with his costume, pushing his still dripping member back into hiding. I, uh, I'm really hot, he said to the dog cautiously, as if testing out a phrase in a foreign language. There is a cool pond not far from here, the dog told him. Without waiting for further response, the dog turned and began walking away. Spaghetti did not hesitate. He followed, his big squirrel feet clumsily stomping through the br bramble and briar. Soon, not even five minutes later, he stood beside the dog at the edge of a small, well-maintained pond with a man-made wooden dock on one end. You may need to take off that outfit befit. You may need to take off that outfit before you get in, the dog suggested. Spaghetti wondered what an actual squirrel person would do. He also wondered how silly he would look in just his two-headed boxer briefs. Amiable capitulation. I wanted to stay on the moon a little longer, at least long enough to witness Kong's inevitable revenge, but Jerry had had enough. I want to go home, he begged. I smiled as I threw up my hands. For my friend, my savior in times of literary indecision and crisis, I am most accommodating, I declared. Well, thank you very much. Jerry stood up from the red, fuzzy, mushroom-shaped stool he had been, he'd been occupying and dusted off his hands. Crackers. When are we heading for the transcapsule station? I don't think we'll need a capsule, I mused. Well, what then? Stinky freighter? No stinky freighters for us, my friend. I stood up from the stack of Grant Green albums I'd been sitting on. Follow me, I instructed, crooking her finger. We'll travel in style. Most curious, Jerry wondered what I meant. I opened a door on a small, cell-like scribarium. Inside was a rude writing desk, such as Rod McEwen might have used in his cattle-punching years, knocking out an ode to some cowboy after the day was done and he'd returned to his flophouse room. On the desk were a couple of pages. Your manuscript? Jerry asked. No, not exactly. Something else I'm working on. I handed Jerry a page. Read it. Jerry glanced about. I wish I'd brought my mushroom stool, he lamented, but not too morbidly. After all, it wasn't only a stool that he was missing, and it was in the other room if he wasn't too lazy to go get it. Meanwhile, I had taken up my place on the overturned milk crate, still bearing the marks of rivets on Rob, on Rob McEwen's jeans. An old man sharpening a knife, Jerry read the title aloud. You stole that. Keep reading, I urged, settling back to enjoy the sound of my own words. Can't settle too far back on a milk crate. You might fall off. Jerry and I hitched a ride with a congressional delegation traveling in a convoy li of limousines. I told the congressman's chief of budget analysis how grateful I was, but she only smiled briefly and returned to her reading. The old man, lodged for the time being in a large wooden room with no windows and apparently no doors, sat in a chair and stared at the knife he held in his hands. It's a good knife, he said. I don't think it needs any sharpening after all, which, if we accept his word, was fortunate, as there seemed to be nothing in the room to sharpen a knife with. The old the old man thumbed the edge of the blade, flexing his thumb intently, trying to make a popping sound with his knuckle. They say it is caused by air bubbles in the cartilage, he said. It makes you wonder whether popping your knuckles may actually be good for you as you grow older. Perhaps continually, continually releasing these air bubbles may promote the retention of cartilage. He dropped his head, already low, even lower. His elbows rested on his knees. Thinking about his sister, who insisted on a conventional view of most things, he said that he must find out what she thought about it. She had, probably not, she had probably never popped her knuckles in her life. The old man sank to the floor. It was composed of long strips of wood from which the varnish had vanished so long ago that Dickensian phrases had probably been uttered of the initial discovery of its absence. The old man was on his hands and knees, the knife still clutched in one hand. He stared at the floor, puzzling over the random images to be found in the cracks, the whirls, the traces of old stains. Slowly he crawled into a corner, amazed that he was not hindered or wounded by splinters along the way. The oil of human contact is all that preserves this floor, he said, as he painfully propped himself against two, the two converging walls. Here in the corner, here in the corner, the dust and dirt were thicker. The old man's legs and backside became covered as he worked his body into position. With something of the energy and defiance of his younger days, he stabbed the knife into the floor, making it stand on end, telling himself that this, re that this readied it for action should action be required. He stared into the room and waited. Soon, however, he lapsed into disgusted boredom and weariness. He pulled the knife free and laid it across his belly. I should have dragged the chair over here, he said. Protein Mash After the failure of Richard's health food snack paste, the Brown Finger Corporation, which had contracted to produce and market the product, decided to try again. 
It's a similar concept, explained Barrett Mulch Much, whose organic loft had been the same had the same vitamin-y smell as your local hippie co-op. But instead of squeezing it onto your bread, you mix it up with a little hot water to make a quick morning pick-me-up. What's the angle? asked Brad, chief of obtainance. Well, Barrett began as he took a seat around the table made from a single slab of naturally felled California redwood. Remember those sepia-toned cartoons from the 70s that actually included hatchwork in the drawings? Like the picture on the old Quaker Instant Oatmeal box, Jennifer suggested. Right, Barrett shot her with a pistol made of his thumb and forefinger. Only that picture wasn't animated. But neither will the picture on the label of this. Jennifer consulted her copy of the proposed Barrett had handed around. Protein mash. No, but I foresee it coming to life in the television spots. Several chairs were shifted at this. People murmured and uncomfortably glanced about. Sorry, Barrett looked down at the tabletop. Old habit. Of course, I mean internet spots. Teeth flashed. Those present seemed relieved. All they had us except Mother Marumtian. He... All they had us except Morther Marumtian. He wriggled nervously before slamming his hands on the table. Are we becoming complacent, he demanded. Morther, what do you mean? Brad turned his attention to the other man. He hadn't liked the idea of the health food paste and didn't like the idea of the protein mash and was willing to turn to anybody ready to distract him. The internet is fine, Morther breathed for forcefully, but isn't it time we began considering direct mental intervention? Oh, Christ, not this again, Jennifer shook her head and swore. Tangled with chemicals is already experimenting with microwaving highly suggestible inducements into the brains of potential customers, Morther began, only to be interrupted by Barrett. Tanglewood Chemicals is a chemical company, Barrett insisted loudly, his eyes as wide as some nocturnal bird of prey. We use chemicals in the production of our lunchtime cereals, Little Marie pointed out. Those are all natural derivatives of indigenous sweat and locally sourced poverty. poverty. Barrett scratched his ear nervously as he fought back. Across town, little Marie's father sat down to a lunchtime bowl of cereal. And not just any cereal, he told his wife. Not a breakfast cereal at all, but a lunchtime cereal. I know, Paul. I was here when Marie explained it. Marie's mother dipped her grilled cheese sandwich into her tomato soup. I think the, op the idea is a great one, Paul. Officer Material shook his head with enthusiasm, overwhelmed with the great idea. He poured the special green juice, anti-milk, over the wool full of crunchy bronze clusters and turned the box around to read the back. The Legend of Dud Eagle Builder And so that some say, little as it may be read, that so sullied were the faces, Nacrayam changes fuel and mate if it will. Original processes by which we same thinging that old and truncheon begallant. Twice this referral is the ulterior kept. So how is Steve? I like to inject a little appliance with the beetle tutic ossiary. That knowing is low and kept. Never a reputation among the clonk-eyed sick wheel. No bree bird to get together tone, as it is so, as it is named in the so luck sieve abounding ultrax, where of armor airplane endearing. Tragedy, formation, nutritive elements scorned by rascal. Rascal up and China's passageway cheating. You're cheating, she towed, line ampule ligament, so why the presbyter? Solvent. The last time Chowman Bean and Betray Gallagher Gibbon was in a direct mind intervention short film called The Journalist Controls His Pulse. This film was in the service of Tanglewood Chemical to pr promote their new domestic solvent, Powig Chemosestrata. Chemos it was beamed into the heads of any sentient beings walking past Tanglewood Chemical kiosks erected in hundreds of malls across the country. It is likely that, due to the relatively wide band of reception, several dozen secretly intelligent dogs watched the film as well. What their reactions were is unknown. However, we do know that whereas the solvent brand's recognition was not significantly increased by the film, many people who harbored feelings of nostalgia for the two-headed boxer franchise were unaccountably happy for some days following their exposure. One typical experience was that of Lum Begoni, a temporary worker at a cabinet factory. He reported enjoying the sight of Garlicker Gibbon stealing a horse and racing to the rescue of a basket of kittens floating in a vat of Poe Chemosestrata. Only thing is, Begoni explained, them kittens wasn't in no danger at all, it turns out, as this new solvent don't act on animal life forms. When questioned further as to whether he would feel personally safe using the product, Begoni was unsure, as he did not consider human beings to be animal life forms. They are made in the image of their god, Garlicker Gibbon sneered, talking to his stolen horse. He patted its black neck and gazed, gazed out over Blackberry Valley. This place was chosen wisely, he thought. Not only, not only will the reporter and I be sheltered, sheltered from the prying eyes of the celebrity patrol, but there are plenty of blackberries to eat. 
He urged the horse to amble forward through the ancient stone gate and into the food court. Mr. Gibbon, I'm glad you could make it, the reporter, an exact digital duplicate of James Garner, except for his voice, which was that of a professional voice actor impersonating impersonating Don Adams, extended the hand of the talking ape in the fringed leather frontiersman's costume and helped him to a secluded booth near the so-called European delicatessen. I didn't expect you to turn up on a horse, the reporter began pleasantly. What's his name? Um, Gibbon considered, turning to stare at the horse. The animal was drinking from a decorative fountain in the middle of the food court. Hippopolitus, he decided. The reporter laughed. <laughs> that's good, he cried. He checked to see if his recording equipment was working. Oh, that's good. Gibbon nodded indifferently. He glanced about to assure himself of their privacy. So what have you been doing since we last heard from you? Gibbon thought about it. Should he even bother to mention his poetry? He had decided recently that he wrote poetry. What kind? He wasn't quite sure. However, as it was most likely the kind that would not go down well with the average reader of the kinds of periodicals sold in grocery store checkout lines, he said nothing about it. He confined himself to a few words about getting in touch with his inner self. What about your current love life? Gibbon fingered his flintlock. I still believe in romance, he said. Are you working on any, on any projects? Taking a deep breath, Gibbon launched into a lengthy description of an exciting script he was interested in. It concerned the global chocolate trade and the daily struggle of the men and women involved in it to find fulfillment. There were also several subplots about pirates battling dinosaurs and genetically engineered furniture that behaved like ruminants, but Gibbon didn't go into detail. Any boxing in it? the reporter asked. Gibbon's eyes flashed. I'm more than just a monkey, he affirmed evenly. Meanwhile, the horse had struck up a conversation with a girl handling, handing out samples in front of the Chinese place. I've never tried meat before, he told her. Erectile pollution. In the next valley stood a tall metal scaffold, scaffold enclosing a drill. Any time now, the vital material we seek will be found, Dr. Maitman swore. He and his team stood in the shadow of an immense boulder near the, near the construction. As they passed a bag of green popcorn among themselves, Rod and Pee Wee discussed the situation. They subcontracted the work to a lo group of locals, Rod told Pee Wee. Made a bundle. He shook his head, contemplating the cleverness on display. I noticed you didn't say a fortune, Pee Wee replied. Arad accepted the popcorn bag from a neighbor, but passed it on without taking any. He was a traditionalist about things like popcorn and money. I reserve the word fortune for large amounts, the kind of money a man could retire on, uh, retire on. but this... He again shook his head as he gestured towards the drill and its support structure. Dr. Maitman heard nothing of the various discussions going on around him. He watched the drill closely. It had already passed through the Earth's outer coating of primal meringue. What lay beneath was highly speculative. Birds combing through the plaid impediments to the south had presaged yet more meringue, albeit tougher and blacker than that which we are used to seeing scattered about the roots of melons and the like. But Maitman's mother wasn't so sure. It'll be broken wafers of narco-crystals, she predicted, all interla interlaced like the horns of a traffic jam. Traffic jam, Bar Barbetta mused. I wonder what that would taste like. She wiped her fingers on a service bird. Ask Steve Winwood, the rivets man standing at hand suggested. Barbetta, who had had all the popcorn green or otherwise she could stand for a while, opened her mouth as if she had been playfully goosed in the hips by a naughty monkey. Not that kind of jam, she laughed in a happy parody of shock. Quiet, all of you, Dr. Maitman ordered. I think it's about ready to goosh forth. Pee-wee and Rod giggled behind their neckerchiefs at the science man's choice of words while the drill and scaffolding assembly shuddered in expectation of geospasm. Down in the valley of Retromadal, at the other end of the valley, the cactus... Down in the village of Retromadal, at the other end of the valley, the cactus farmers gathered for the monthly market. Mascumo, in his colorful robes and hats, unloaded his cart of many fine examples of the spe several species of cactus he grew high in the hills surrounding the valley. He was greeted by Luba, a fellow farmer and distant cousin. Ever since the Westerners imposed their religion on us, things have become so much better. Wouldn't you agree, Maskumo? Luba asked his contemporary. Yes, I would, Maskumo concurred. The way in which our people have combined their native beliefs with those of the Westerners has created a unique religious experience only to be had here in the Valley of the Solemn Earth Secretions. I see you have brought some of these, strength, of these new cacti you've been talking about for so long. Luba indicated a group of strangely shaped cacti with mauve stripes down their dark green sides. Yes, I have been eating them for some time now and can attest that they cause no problems of any kind to the system. The flesh is so soft, Luba explained as he, exclaimed as he handled one. Yes, try some. Maskumo offered the other man a small knife with which to cut the, cut the cactus. At that moment, the ground shook and the bell tower, the central feature of the market square, fell down. 
It was built by the Westerners and has dominated our municipal transactions for centuries, Luba cried. Pieces of unchewed cactus fell from his mouth and the juice thereof dribbled down his chin. Help me, one of the other farmers, whose display table had been nearer the tower, begged. Mascumo, followed closely by Lula, Mascumo, followed closely by Luba, ran to the fellow's aid. The man lay pinned beneath his own table, stones and debris weighing everything down. Mascumo bent to lift the obstruction, but struggled in vain. What's wrong? Luba demanded. I, I can't get it up. Mascumo grunted. Far away, the laughter of Doctor Maitman could be heard. Blank tile. You cheated, Mercedes accused her husband Bach. I did not, expostulated, expostulated Bach in return. Then where is it? I don't know. It must have fallen off the table. Bach looked around. Under the table, on the floor, around the table. He got down on his knees and looked under the furniture. Nothing. It's not here, he insisted. Well, it was here the last time we played the game. Are you sure? That was a stupid question. Of course, it was there the last time, or they would have noticed it last time. Mercedes's look said as much. Well, the game is forfeit, she declared, throwing up her hands. It is not. Bach adopted a conciliatory, conciliatory but firm tone. If there was no intent to deceive, then there is no reason to invalidate the outcome. Well, he had won. Of course, he would take that view. The game wasn't played properly, whether we knew it or not. You take it so seriously. Me? You're the one who's always so damned set on winning. You have to win. Bach wanted to say, well, that just shows you that I wouldn't cheat. In an amateur game like this, winning is its own reward. Cheating would, would invalidate the win. Now, in a professional game with money at stake... But before he could think of anything that he, that he could say with impunity, Hith entered the room, followed by a giant squirrel. Hith, Bach cried. What's this? He and Mercedes got to their feet and faced the new situation, ready to run if need be. They joined each other on the opposite side of the table from the, from the two newcomers. The dog said nothing, but the squirrel, evidently one of the squirrel people they had occasionally glimpsed over the years, moving drugs around the county at night in old school buses, bowed politely and addressed the two. Good, good afternoon. Sorry, sorry for barging in like this. The gloofer tells me you are, you are the people who might be able to help me. My name is Curlicue. I'm looking for information on the disappearance of the macaque people. Gloofer? Buck repeated. His eyes were wide. Were squirrels dangerous? They went to the moon, Mercedes inter inter interjected. The moon? The squirrel sounded baffled. How in the hell did they get to the moon? The government took them. The army, Buck corrected. That remains to be proven, Mercedes answered. Well, the science military... Please, the squirrel interrupted. I've had a long day. It's fun to pretend and all, but we're talking reality here. So am I, Mercedes told her uninvited guest. The authorities, she gestured at the uncertain heavens, gathered them all up and shipped them all off to the moon. She pointed over her head. How, if I may ask? In spaceships or something like that. Spaceships? What spaceships? I don't know. The squirrel stood there, fumbling with the fur under his chin. Okay, spaceships, he tentatively agreed. But tell me this, then. Once they got to the moon, what did they do with them? They're living in one of the cities on the moon, Bach into the explanation. The squirrel's shoulders slumped. What cities, he asked wearily, seemingly close to tears. The cities on the moon, Bach sounded weary himself. Hippies live there, mostly. The squirrel looked about him. You mind if I sit down a minute, he begged. This is a bit much for me to take in. He sat on the chair. Tell me something. How do you people know all this? Mercedes smiled smugly. We play Scrabble, she preened. He, unnoticed by any of the participants, slipped outside and disappeared behind a bucket.